Hello. First of all, I want to thank you for the uh, much warmer weather <laughs> here than where I was previously. Um, Snowmageddon wasn't so fun. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about how cyber criminals are using uh, and targeting rewards program accounts to make money these days. I'm going to take you through some real life attack, defense, and dark market exploration. What I'm about to share with you is something that came out of my firsthand experience fighting cyber fraud and then my passion of wanting to understand how it works. About six months ago, my colleagues and I were alerted to a bunch of simultaneous increases in strange traffic to multiple customer web properties. When we dug into the traffic, we found that customer login URLs were being targeted by scripts that were rolling through large sets of login credentials. Automated account checkers. We've seen these before. Now, typically, they target e-commerce, retail, uh, travel, those sorts of uh, web properties. And what they do is they use login details gleaned from breaches of other websites. And then they will try those logins again and again on uh, these customers that they're targeting. Now, what they're doing is they're counting on people reusing the same logins across multiple websites. Nobody here does that, right? All right, so we've seen this before. We know what to do. We've got the playbook for it. We're going to run it. We see that the IPs spewing out all of the malicious traffic. What they are mostly is virtual shared hosting, you know, vulnerable WordPress, Joomla, uh, and other CMS systems, Mac botnet IPs, and consumer IPs. Most of these consumer IPs we were able to figure out were actually popped home routers uh, and NAS devices that were hacked. So now we just find the solid request patterns, we drop some geo blocks in place, we fire up our IP blacklists, and then we start serving up some 403 responses. Easy enough and finished in time for lunch. What more could you ask for? <laughs> Apparently a lot more. So what we ran into this time that was different than the previous times we fought off these guys is unlike the times we did before, now they're not just buzzing off and finding softer targets. They're coming back at us with new techniques. Our geo blocks and our IP blacklists, they were met with a flood of new rotating IP addresses coming from VPN services and a series of different open and private proxies. Hola, I'm looking at you for one of the big, uh, the big contenders here. And the previous request patterns that we set in place to match against their traffic became useless to us. They started switching up their user agents, and they started switching up uh, the actual order of their headers. All right, fine. Emerald Lagasse time. Bam, tightened rate controls on the login URLs. Bam, valid refer checks. Come at me, bro. I've got you. So the illegitimate traffic to the login URLs we were defending starts dropping off pretty quickly. Awesome, we've got it. Well, not so much. So now they just start hitting the mobile ABIs and start hitting the uh, really, really interesting legacy login paths that the customer developers uh, left in place and didn't realize were still publicly available. Uh, so now this tit for tat isn't really working for us. And we have to get smart about how we're responding to these guys because they're meeting each of our uh, ways of blocking them. So what if we get a little more uh, subtle in how we're dealing with them? So what we're going to do here is we're going to stop, stop blocking out the requests so they switch IPs or go through another proxy. And we're going to start tar pitting them or long routing them. We're going to make their traffic really slow but not be stopped or timed out. And then when they get to the end of that route, we're going to serve them up a fake you've successfully logged in page. So now they think, oh, these login credentials work. And they move on to the next set of credentials. So after this, we saw some smaller follow-up waves, but no further pivots and techniques, because this gave us the time to work with the customers to fix their API login logics and to nuke the legacy paths that were being exploited. Finally, the siege was lifted. Now this was curious. This was a real break from the past for these types of attacks. The attackers really put a lot of thought and effort into responding to our defensive maneuvers. 
Now that we were no longer in shits on fire mode, I wanted to figure out why they were using all of these ti this time and these resources to respond to us instead of just going after easier targets like they have in the past. So the data in these types of accounts, PII, rewards points, miles, uh, partial credit card info, this isn't anything that's changed from the past. All that is about the same information. And when I look at the legislative landscape or the industries themselves, there haven't been any significant changes that should make the intrinsic value of these accounts higher, such that people want to spend more resources going after them. I guess that leaves the resale market for these types of goods. So how do they monetize these accounts? Now, the initial obvious path, of course, would be to go for the credit card information in the account. But even when you log in as the customer in these accounts, you don't necessarily see the credit card information in full. So you can't just take it out and sell it that way. What you'd have to do is go in and use the card attached to the account to buy more rewards, to buy points, to buy miles, uh, and sometimes to buy tangible goods through the reward store. Now, they can take those uh, purchased goods and services, and they can resell them. You know, things like watches, designer bags, gift cards, that sort of thing. After they change the user's address info, the shipping address info, then they can ship the tangible goods to one of their drops, and then they can go ahead and resell it. You know, something like Craigslist or eBay or Wallpop. Uh, so they could even use work at home mules to do this reshipping for them so they don't have to deal with the actual tangible goods. But then you run into issues like the mules flipping on you because the cops are really looking hard at these kind of reshipping schemes right now. You also have to run the risk of your mules just stealing your stuff and taking your money. So instead of dealing with all of that hassle, is there a market for just the digital part of these rewards accounts? Is there a large enough market to make it worth it? And looking for markets selling these types of goods, I wanted to make sure that they met a few conditions. It needed to have quantifiable transaction histories. That's where I can go into the website and actually see a history of a seller's transactions, which ones have gone through, which ones failed, and uh, the reviews of those transactions. I also needed to have uh, a way to make sure that I wasn't funding crime directly. Uh, if I went to a pay-to-play closed forum or IRC channel, then I would be paying directly into criminals, and the legal department at my work wouldn't be so happy with me about that. I also needed to make sure that the barriers to entry weren't too high or too costly. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of these um, forums that have markets attached to them that require another criminal to vouch for you. And usually the way you do that is by proving your own criminality to them. I didn't want to get into that. I also wanted to make sure that these markets had a high enough traffic to make it worth the research. This set of criteria led me to focus on the dark net onion router markets. There are a lot of markets to choose from with varying degrees of uptime, uh, activity, and volatility. So I chose to further narrow down the target markets by selecting for those that were currently active and that had an uptime greater than 95%. In terms of activity and interest, they needed to, as of November 2015, uh, have Google search impressions of greater than 60,000 and Google keywords greater than 100. This led me to look at these top three tour markets, Alpha Bay, Dream Market, and Nucleus Market. I knew these markets had a lot of drugs on offer, but when it came to hacked goods, I was admittedly surprised with what I found. Credit cards, accounts for Netflix, Hulu, HBO, Spotify, stolen PayPal accounts, Steam accounts, uh, and a lot of porn site memberships. Across the three markets, there was a total of 14,183 digital goods for sale. Things like hacked accounts, malware, e-gift cards. And there were 15,426 specifically fraud-related digital goods for sale. Those are things like uh, personally identifiable information, we'll talk more about that later, uh, credit card numbers, and bank drops. Here's what I found in, inside of those numbers. That there were whole accounts for sale, these are rewards accounts, 
where specifically the rewards or points balance was called out as a sales feature for these accounts. I found 20 listings of these across seven unique vendors with 2,014 confirmed sales. What about the vouchers and e-gift cards that you could get through these rewards accounts? 54 different listings across 13 unique vendors with 3,136 sales. Now, when we're looking at just the rewards points, there were only three listings across three unique vendors, but they had a total of 698 sales between them. Talk about cornering the market. What about air miles? Those are worth a lot, right? Here I only found four listings across four vendors totaling in only 100 sales. What's going on there? Well, I went to the different uh, air miles programs and started to look at their policies. And it turns out within the past few years, a large number of them have really cracked down on their transfer policies and make it very difficult to just transfer it. Thus, its fungibility is lost. So, out of all of this, there is one section that really blew me away that I wasn't expecting to be as large as it was. Personal criminal travel agents. These listings offer highly discounted custom bookings for flights, trains and buses, cruises, hotels, car rentals, you name it. They even have their own cancellation and refund policies. The way that these sellers assure you that your travel won't be canceled is they promise you they're not using stolen credit cards, they're just using rewards points. So it might seem pretty sketchy and easily stoppable, but something must be working. Because I'm looking at 93 general listings, 94 custom orders, across 31 unique vendors, that's a lot of people in the marketplace, with a total sales of 4,808. On top of this, the majority of them had rave reviews. That's crazy. What kind of timeline are we talking here? Let's give some context to these numbers. Well, these sales numbers are only since March 2015. So across 10 months, in only three darknet markets, there were 10,756 confirmed sales. And these are all rewards account related goods. And this isn't even counting the listings that have been taken down or the vendors that have since closed shop. 10,756. I'd say there's a large enough market. All right, so these pushers of purloined points are making Bitcoin hand over fist. Now they can use these Bitcoins to turn around and purchase other things on the darknet market. But how do they get cold, hard cash without winding up in jail? Here's where the cash out technique is crucial. The darknet markets aren't just full of drugs and hacked accounts. They're also filthy with guides on how to cash out safely. Many of these guides claim to have unique or obscure processes for doing so. Most of these guides start with the suggestion of using a Bitcoin tumbling service. This is where your Bitcoins are mixed with a lot of other folks' Bitcoins so that you get out new, fresher Bitcoins uh, that are harder to trace. Some of these guides also suggested uh, when you tumble your Bitcoins to do it in a series of small transactions with differing amounts over a long period of time to make it even harder to trace through the blockchain. So now they've got some clean-er Bitcoins, but they're still traceable by a decent forensics expert. In fact, Damon McCoy, who spoke earlier, has done some excellent work in this area. I highly suggest some of the papers that he's written in tracing Bitcoins. So they can't just open up a Bitcoin exchange account with Coinbase or Zappo or Circle. All of these now comply with anti-money laundering and uh, know-your-customer laws. They require extensive background and identity checks. So if they can't verify their own identities, how do they set up an exchange? They can use somebody else's. After all, in the United States, somebody's identity is stolen every two seconds. $16 billion worth of identity fraud has affected almost 13 million people since 2014. Since 2005, there have been about 5,700 breaches of unencrypted personal information. 
And within this, there has been about 855 million of these records stolen. So naturally, what this means is that back in the darknet markets, there is a plethora of affordable listings for something called fools, F-U-L-L-Z. One set of fools costs between 10 and 20 bucks, and what you get out of it is a pile of personal information for somebody else. Things like social security number, mother's maiden name, date of birth, their physical address history, phone number history, and more. Okay, so now they're on their way, but they can't quite pass a hardcore ID verification. What do they need for that? Well, they need not fret, because on the dark net, lots of vendors also sell expertly and custom doctored scans of passports, ID cards, and utility bills. So with the fools and the forged documents, they stand a good chance of passing a rather rigorous ID verification system. So now they'll need a bank account to attach to their Bitcoin exchange service. They can head back to the darknet markets, and uh, there, there are vendors that actually sell uh, pre-made bank drops just for this. But most of the guides suggested you make your own clean bank account. That way you control it and you know its history. Many different financial institutions will allow these crooks to uh, set up these new accounts all online, all from their home, and uh, just using the same information that they got from uh, the fools. Now, when you're paying for a guide on how to set up these bank accounts, what you're actually typically paying for is a walkthrough on what to expect for certain banks um, and what sort of challenges you'll come up against and uh, how best to pass them. They'll also need a new phone number to do this. So here the suggestion is to get a burner phone with exchangeable SIMs. And on top of that, it's often suggested to not use the SIM number directly, but to attach it to another phone number, a VoIP number like Google Voice. Now, if they don't want to go through the process of verifying and setting up a Google account, the darknet mar uh, markets also sell pre-set up Google Voice accounts. So they've got their exchange account set up, and they've got their clean bank account set up. Time to cash out some Bitcoins. How do they actually get the cash out of the bank of account? So here, there are guides for getting the ATM card without getting caught, and uh, how to securely get that by, by avoiding cameras. Um, there's also guides for wiring to uh, Western Union, MoneyGram, RIA, those sort of uh, services, using an alias. Or they can just keep it online, and what they can do is they can set up a PayPal or Google Wallet account with the identity that they've already stolen. Those, of course, were not the only cash-out methods that I ran into. There are vendors who will ship you silver and gold in exchange for Bitcoins though it's at a hefty premium, as you would imagine. There are vendors who will uh, go ahead and sell you a bunch, uh, like I'm talking a huge stack, of stolen gift cards. And it's usually at a discount. And what you can do is turn around and sell those stolen gift cards to legitimate gift card buyback services like Gift Card Granny or Raise.com. That way you're then being paid by that website. There were gift card or there were uh, cash out uh, techniques for setting up uh, two accounts on uh, freelance sites like Fiverr or um, Guru, uh, Guru or Upwork, something like that. What you would do is you would set up an account as a uh, servicer, an account as someone who needs a service. You would act as both parties and transfer the money using the website and then get paid out through the website. There were other uh, methods involving setting up bogus projects on crowdfunding websites. Some of these crowdfunding websites, conveniently enough, took Bitcoin directly, so that made it easier. Uh, there's also a way to cash out using uh, things like vanilla money pack. These are prepaid uh, cards that are typically anonymous. And what you can do is you can buy those from darknet vendors that have set them up using other identities. There are also uh, some uh, interesting methods that involve using a gambling or bookmaker site. What you'll do is you'll transfer your funds uh, into the gambling site. You'll do a bit of low-risk gambling. You might lose a little bit, but not much. And then after a little while, you cash out into a different currency. A lot of these sites will also ship you a, uh, uh, send you a check or they'll ship you prepaid cards. Um, there's also uh, some 
rather skeevy ways that you can set up a charity. Um, there are even guides for getting your uh, 5013C um, to look legitimate um, and set up your own uh, charity that's connected to something like a network for good or a good or a give well account. That way you can receive funds uh, into your charity and uh, they, they give you the guide to actually get other people to give you money as well as launder your own money. Uh, those ones uh, felt rather slimy. Uh, there were more um, almost legitimate looking guides for setting up your own shell business and then connecting it to something like Square, Flint, Stripe, or SparkPay, and then funneling funds through that. If you didn't want to go through the process of setting up a whole new corporation, there are people on the dark net who will sell you an aged, off-the-shelf shell corporation. So all of these methods seemed rather convoluted, and I could see different areas in them, no matter what they promised, where you could easily get popped. The easiest and most straightforward methods that I saw, though, involved just using local bitcoins. On local bitcoins, you can convert bitcoins directly into gift cards, prepaid or reloadable cards, postal orders, cash. There are also options for wire transfers, PayPal, Google Wallet, and Square transfers. These can be done in person, or they can be done completely online, even the wire transfers. Oh, and if any of these cyber criminals end up finding that they need to get a custom physical ID card for any of their plans, they actually don't need to go back to the dark net. They can just get those from Reddit. So with all of these cash out methods, there's also, as mentioned before, the option to deal in real, tangible, physical goods. With, if you're dealing with rewards points and e-gift cards instead of dealing with stolen uh, credit cards, you don't have to worry about the chargebacks or credit card fraud investigations. You do, however, have to deal with shipping and finding a way to receive these goods. Well, on the darknet markets, there are shipping label services that will help you out with that. Uh, there are also many guides on how to safely set up shipping drops. Many of these guides suggest not dealing with actual humans as drops, but to seek out houses where folks are on vacation or the house or business has recently vacated. Or even how to set up a series of PO boxes using other identities. There was also a lot of advice for spotting and dealing with controlled deliveries. Now what a controlled delivery is, it's when law enforcement will act as the postal carrier or the deliverer and will deliver the box, wait for you to sign it, and then slap on the cuffs. So I did run across a clever method for straight up bypassing all of the hassle of dealing with these reshipping schemes. It was a play on the old eBay triangulation fraud. Here's how it works. An e-commerce customer would place an order with an individual offering to sell a luxury good, typically through eBay, uh, through Amazon.com, through Alibaba, something like that. And uh, what they would do is the seller of the good doesn't actually have the purchased item in stock. They would go ahead and change the shipping address on a hacked rewards account to the customer, and then they would go into the reward store that is a legitimate reward store and use those stolen points to buy what the original customer ordered. And then they would ship it to that customer through that account. Now, the customer actually gets what they ordered. It seems legit to them. But what happens when an investigation starts? Who do you think becomes the main suspect? Not the fraudulent seller. Their information wasn't involved anywhere in the process. It's the customer that received the item, that thought it was legitimate. They're the one that becomes the target of the investigation. So as you can see, rewards fraud business is booming, and it pays. I expect we will be seeing more of these attacks in 2016 and witness another expansion of the criminal markets for these goods. Going forward, I want to start expanding my scope of research to look at forums, IRC, and Jabber. I also want to look at these trends over time and start doing analysis. This, coupled with looking at uh, how different attacks are evolving in these spaces, will be very interesting and will help us to be more proactive in the ways in which we deal with these attackers. I also want to look at how to actually do a market valuation in US dollars for these markets. With miles, vouchers, and e-gift cards, it's pretty easy to tell how much they're worth. 
but rewards points don't technically have a monetary value. This is something that the cyber criminals are uh, counting on, because if it doesn't have a technical monetary value, the chances of a fraud investigation are much lower. This is an interesting and ever-evolving area that calls for much more investigation and research. Thank you for your time, and I would like to take some questions and comments from the audience.